Hi, everybody. We're delighted to have you with us for this special broadcast on Ontario's 43rd General Election Night. We're going to set things up for you during our regular 8 to 9 p.m. time slot for the agenda. And then at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, after the polls close, keep it here because we really will have the most comprehensive coverage and analysis available tonight. From Aaron Kelly, from our panel of experienced politicians, from experts on housing, health care and affordability, and from our in-house team of on poly watchers. And a reminder, you can stay tuned to us even if you're on the move on our live stream on TVO.org or on the agenda's Twitter and Facebook pages and chime in on social media while you're there. Meantime, let us put election 43 into context. Each election is different, although there are patterns that emerge throughout history. So let's go through the four major party leaders and see what's what. Up first, Doug Ford, leader of the PC party and Ontario's 26th premier. His new government got elected four years ago, pledging to bring radical, disruptive, populist change to Ontario, and that approach promptly put his polling numbers in the dumper. But the pandemic gave Ford a chance to change the channel, and he did. Historically, Ford also has this going for him. No elected conservative or liberal premier whose party is in its first term in office has ever been denied a second term. Let me say that again. No elected conservative or liberal premier whose party is in its first term in office has ever been denied a second term. If Ford wins tonight, he'll continue an historic trend that's lasted since Confederation. Second, Andrea Horvath, Ontario's NDP leader. Horvath was the official opposition leader in the last House. She is a real anomaly in politics these days in as much as this is her fourth election as leader. As we've seen with the federal Conservatives, oftentimes you can get the boot after just one loss. Horvath is hoping history repeats from more than three decades ago when the NDP went from third place in 1985 to official opposition in 1987 to government in 1990. Third, Stephen Del Duca and the Ontario Liberals. Four years ago, the Liberals received their worst drubbing ever, seven seats. It was an historic collapse. Their new leader, Stephen Del Duca, won the party leadership in March of 2020, just in time to have a global pandemic force him to rebuild his party's finances, find candidates, and create a policy platform process from his living room on Zoom. But Del Duca has brought the Liberals back. Somewhat, their polling numbers are better than last time. We'll see whether the rookie leader can return the Liberals at least to official opposition status and whether he can win back his seat, which he lost four years ago. Of all the leaders, Del Duca's personal victory in Vaughan Woodbridge is the most tenuous. Fourth up, Mike Schreiner, leader of the Ontario Greens. Four years ago, he enjoyed the big breakthrough. The first one Ontario seat by a party other than the Tories, Liberals and New Democrats in seven decades. Schreiner took Guelph by a big margin. Now he's looking for that second breakthrough seat and thinks it could be in Perry Sound, Muskoka, where there is no former sitting member and no Liberal candidate. It took that kind of perfect storm for Schreiner to win in Guelph, and he's hoping history repeats in central Ontario tonight with five-time candidate Matt Richter. And lastly, let's look at 2018 total vote percentage. The PCs won the majority government with 40.5% of the total votes cast. The NDP came second with just under 34%. The Liberals didn't crack 20%, and the Greens at just over 4.5%. And how about seats at dissolution? The Tories actually won 76 seats four years ago, but a number of those members were kicked out of caucus. So at dissolution, the Tories end up with 67 seats, the NDP at 38, the Liberals still at seven, the one Green, Mike Schreiner, and eight others. That's a reference to all of those former defenestrated, as we like to call them, progressive conservatives who got the boot and three vacant seats as well. That was the House at dissolution. And with that in place, we're going to start this off checking in with some policy experts who've been watching this election to see what they'll be looking for tonight. First up, let's talk affordability. The cost of everything is up. Inflation recently surpassed a 30-year high. That's certainly driven conversations as politicians went door to door. So Heb Shahid is Director of Economic Innovation at the Conference Board of Canada, and he joins us now from Scarborough in Ontario's capital city. And so Heb, it's good to have you back on the program. How are you tonight? 
Thanks, Steve. I'm good. How are you? Good. Just great, thanks. Give us a sense, uh, if we can start here, about the choices that you think Ontarians are having to make today as a result of the cost of living. Well, uh, Steve, you know, uh, affordability and cost of living is front and centre in this election, and rightly so. Inflation is at more than a 30-year high, and a lot of people who are voting in this election, they have never seen inflation this high in their life. You know, people are struggling to pay uh, at the gas station. They're struggling to pay at a grocery store. And quite frankly, they're struggling to make ends meet. In all of this affordability talk, it's really the low-income Canadians who are being hit the hardest because they spend a larger share of their monthly expenditure on things like food and energy. But mind you, this is not just a low-income problem. This is fast becoming a middle-class problem. In which case, what do you think in general, what do you think about what the parties have had on offer to deal with the issue of affordability? Well, Steve, you know, I think uh, politicians get too much credit for when the economy is doing well and too much blame for when the economy is not doing so well. And this especially holds true for provincial politics. Having said that, there are things that political parties have proposed. For example, the Liberals, the NDP and the Greens have talked about reducing costs for Ontarians by reducing food costs, um, whereas the PC party has talked about uh, reducing you know, the cost for Ontarians by bringing down energy prices. Um, but the major difference between the incumbent party and its challengers is that uh, the PC party is heavily relying on refundable tax credits, which means that Ontarians will pay less in taxes, but they won't be getting any checks in their mailboxes anytime soon, whereas the other parties are promising more direct support. So when I look at the you know, platform prom promises, Steve, uh, there are things that I do like. I, I like uh, that the Liberals promise to reduce HST on food. I like the PC's party promise to bring down taxes on gas. And I like uh, the NDP's promise to double the GST for low-income uh, low uh, Ontarians. Uh, but, Steve, as you and I know, uh, you know, uh, campaigning is, is poetry and governing is prose. Mm. The efficacy of these measures would really depend on how well they're implemented. Well, let me follow up with you on that idea of taking the HST off food. You know, almost every economist I've ever talked to over the years says monkeying with the HST, monkeying with these sales taxes or retail sales taxes is a bad idea. The more exemptions you give, uh, the less clean the tax is and the less effective it is. And yet you say you like this idea of taking it off prepared foods. How come? Well, the reason for this, uh, Steve, is that, uh, you know, food is an essential item. And food prices have skyrocketed in recent months, not only because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and, you know, if you talk to people on the ground, they'll tell you that, uh, especially low-income Canadians, that they're struggling to pay for their food. Uh, not only that, even some middle-class uh, middle Canadians would, would tell you the same. You know, in normal times, uh, you know, I would agree with some of the economists that you're mentioning, but these are not normal times. These are unusual times. And, you know, times like these call for these type of unusual measures. Would you say the same thing about the price of gas? Because, of course, environmentalists would say a high price of gas uh, means people will be forced to consider alternatives as opposed to burning fossil fuels, which ruins our environment. As the, as the province steps in, or as the other parties have agreed to do as well, as they step in to try to make the price of gas cheaper, they're sort of defeating themselves, environmentally speaking. What's your take on that? Uh, Steve, I think bringing taxes down on gas is, is, I think, a good thing. I'm for it. And, you know, if, uh, you know, one of the parties is proposing it, you know, they won't be the only ones. Uh, you know, other, uh, other political parties in other countries are doing the same. Having said that, you mentioned, you know, the transition, the possible transition to electric vehicles. You know, I've been hearing a lot of commentary about, uh, you know, moving to energy, uh, uh, to electric vehicles and to, you know, refit homes so that, you know, we can tackle uh, the rise in energy prices better. While all of that is true, it is also true that low-income Canadians, they can't afford electric vehicles. They can't afford to refit their homes in some instances. And if you look at the platform promises of all political parties when it comes to electric vehicles, the dollar amount is just not enough to convince low-income Canadians uh, to make that transition. Okay, in our last 30 seconds here then, Sohab, let me ask you, I mean, here's the reality. Uh, the, the Ontario government can't do a damn thing about the war in Ukraine. The Ontario government can't do a thing about uh, supply chain problems which have caused uh, high inflation, certainly uh, you know, higher than anything we've experienced in the last few decades. Can the province really do much about the issue of affordability at the end of the day? 
you know, given the limitations, you know, provincial politics and provincial politicians have, what they can do is to urgently act on, you know, tackling the essentials, you know, the basics, the necessities of life, such as food and energy, uh, because this is where, you know, low-income Ontarians are hurting the most. And this is where, you know, intervention is needed. And this is where substantive intervention is needed so that, you know, we see, uh, you know, a significant difference in monthly expenditures for Canadians because a lot of the promise, promises that have been announced by political parties, yes, they will bring down costs for Ontarians, but they just don't do enough when it comes to bringing down costs. And I think they're also a bit too complex for the average voter to understand. So I think these measures alone that have been announced so far, those alone won't be enough to convince someone to vote for one party over, over the other. Gotcha. So, Hab, it's good of you to join us tonight. Enjoy election night, okay? Thanks, Steve. Next up, let's look more closely at that big ticket item, housing. With us now on that, in Corktown, in the provincial capital, Eric Lombardi. He's the founder of More Neighbors Toronto. Eric, it's nice to have you back on the program. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me uh, back on the show. Excited Terrific. To be here. Terrific to have you here. Were you satisfied? Let's start here. Were you satisfied with what appeared to be a pretty prominent place for housing policy in the major party platforms in this campaign. I was happy to see the direction the parties are taking on the issue. Uh, a lot of them made high level commitments to doing the right thing, like you know, 1.5 million new homes. The issue is still the lack of urgency on the campaign trail and in the details. Okay, fill that in a little bit. What, what, what lack of urgency were you sensing? The lack of urgency that I, I am seeing is, you know, especially for the parties that did actually put out a platform, which was not the Conservatives, um, they paid tribute to the right concepts uh, and the things that we need to do, and then have the, what they really needed to be doing. So on promises like exclusionary zoning, great, except, you know, we see for the Liberals plan, two stories max. So when you dig into the details, what type of impact will those policy have? Not big ones, not the ones that we need. Was there anything, Eric, that sort of jumped at you where you could say, oh, yeah, I really like that. That sounds good. Uh, I was really happy to see that both the NDP and the Ontario Liberals proposed creating a public housing builder. Um, there's a lot of cities and countries worldwide that have public builders that build on public property in mixed income formats to actually provide that diversity and to address needs like for those who have disabilities, who need shelter and other types of programs. And, you know, those complement the market developments quite well in those places. And it's been a bit bizarre that it's been so behind in the conversation until now. Do you think there's any possibility that the Conservatives might steal some of those ideas if they come back in tonight? Uh, not a public builder, but I think there's a lot of good ideas that they can be stealing. And, you know, we'll see where things go if they get elected again, because they keep saying the Housing Affordability Task Force report, which is really quite a comprehensive document that I think even impressed housing advocates like me. Um, if that really is something they start to deliver on, it could, uh, they could do a good job, but they've made no commitment. Well, I think they made no commitment because they said there was not enough support at the municipal level to make a commitment. They, they, it wasn't that they d rejected the ideas. They just didn't see enough support out there. Do you think yeah. that if, again, we're in the realm of speculation here, but do you think that if they get a renewed majority tonight, that might give them, who knows, the guts to, to go after this issue with a little more force? It definitely gives them the time to be forgiven um, if they have a majority, right? And I think that's the, the string of hope that I am holding on to. The reality is the municipalities are failing and it's not even like an accident. They are deliberately hostile in most cases to, to the types of reforms we need because frankly, they're beholden to a very small subset of voters who A, show up during municipal elections and B, show up and yell at them between them. <laughs> and, you know, the reality is the province needs to be more prescriptive prescriptive and aggressive if they really want to tackle this issues. The cities, they're not going to get it done. They won't get it done. And when given the chance, they'll do the bare minimum. We've heard that expression before in this election campaign. Get it done. It's in your head. I can tell. 
Uh, let me ask you this, Eric, do you think housing policy is a partisan issue? No, um, I don't. And in More Neighbors, we really pride ourselves on having a big tent. And so we have people who are partisan from, you know, NDP, Green, to the conservatives who really support us um, in what we're talking about. This issue isn't partisan as much as it is um, generational and also, I would even say, rational, because I know there are a lot of older voters who look at what's happened and realize the quality of life that their children have to accept is going to be substantially lower than their own. And they, they see that as a fundamental economic issue too. So this sort of transcends party uh, and all parties have a mix of those who are pro and anti uh, housing. And my hope is that the tide is shifting to that pro voice. We shall see. Eric Lombardi, appreciate you joining us here on Election Night on TVO. Take care. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And of course, in the midst of a global pandemic, myriad concerns around health care came up during this campaign. Let's check in with family physician Dr. Danielle Martin, who is chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto, and she joins us now from the west end of the provincial capital. And I know you and I talked during the election campaign, Dr. Martin, but I wonder whether you think health care got the attention that it either normally does or should get during the course of an election campaign. What do you think? I think it got the right amount of attention, Steve. It's hard to imagine an election in the middle of a global pandemic that wouldn't be a health care election. Uh, what I think is going to be hard is to move from conversations looking backward to the conversation looking forward that we need to have, because although we may be done with the pandemic, it's not done with its effects on our health care system. Well, you know, elections are kind of, as Kim Campbell once said, uh, you know, odd times to be talking about serious policy. But having said that, do you think the major parties demonstrated some understanding of what they learned over the past two years that they could therefore bring forward in the event that they win? I think that all the parties showed uh, an awareness of the incredible importance of rethinking aging, which is going to be a very uh, important uh, policy file thinking forward. Uh, we saw the effects in long-term care of this pandemic um, and the inexcusable uh, deaths of seniors across Ontario and beyond. And uh, I think for all of us, you know, uh, aging while it beats the alternative is a pretty mm. scary prospect in the province of Ontario right now. And so we really need to think about uh, are we building long term care beds? Is that really what we want to be doing? What kinds of long term care beds are we building? Or more importantly, what can we be doing to support aging in our homes, in our communities where uh, where all of us want to age and where most Canadians want to die? And so being able to have that conversation uh, outside of an election campaign in a really thoughtful way uh, about aging in place is going to be critical. Our health care system cannot withstand um, another round of, um, of uh, lack of community resources for older people. I, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think in terms of whether we really did have a bit of that conversation during this election campaign. I mean, it, it did seem to me that long-term care came up as an issue and the parties did make proposals, maybe more than in any other election in my lifetime. Did you see it that way as well? I did, and I, I'm heartened by that. Um, you know, again, though, I think a lot of the focus was on what went wrong uh, and what we were ill-prepared for in the last round, and that's understandable. And part of democracy is holding ourselves and each other to account for uh, the things we do well and the things that uh, that should have gone better um, in in uh, over the course of this uh, this government's last term. But you know, the hard part comes after, right? Uh, and and I do think that it's it's. These election platforms, of course, were high level. Of course, they were very uh, sort of vague and broad commitments. The question of whether we're going to be able to help people to age at home, to connect them to family doctors, to connect them to home care services, to prevent them from ending up in long-term care, and to prevent them from ending up in the emergency department in crisis, um, is like a, it's a really important topic, and it should be one of the biggest learnings of this pandemic. So um, I am heartened, as you are, that there was a long-term care conversation in this, in this election. Now we're going to have to start talking about what comes next. Well, what we know for sure comes next is we're going to have a new health minister, because the previous health minister, Christine Elliott, didn't run again. So regardless of who wins tonight, we're getting a new health minister in the province of Ontario starting either when the current government gets re-sworn in or when the new government gets sworn in. 
In which case, if you've got their ear right now, what do you want to tell them? We have a very serious fallout now from the pandemic today in our hospitals, in our emergency departments, in our family doctor's offices that is not uh, identifiable as COVID related, but is, uh, is going to be the challenge of the next four years to figure out how to reconnect people with care who were lost to follow up to deal with all of the folks who are showing up in the emergency department and being admitted to the hospital with more advanced illness because it wasn't caught uh, during this difficult time, to deal with the burnout that our healthcare workers are facing, uh, the number of people who are coming into family doctors' offices now with a list of seven, eight, ten items that they've been putting off hmm. over the last uh, over the last couple of years, the profound mental health impacts. I mean, this is the the ripple effect of what we've lived through for the last two years. And if we don't figure out how to shore up our capacity in the community, in family doctor's offices, in primary care practices, in team-based care, so that people can get the care they need close to home, they're all gonna land in the emergency department. And our emergency departments are already under tremendous pressure right now, Steve. If you talk to anyone who's had to go to the eMERGE or if you talk to anyone who works in an eMERGE, uh, they will tell you that we are we are beyond our capacity right now. And so we really, the solution to that is not more hospitals and emergency departments and hospital beds. The solution to that is the alternative, which is family medicine, primary care, home care. We've been having this conversation in this in this province for decades about the need to move our resources and our attention out of hospitals and closer to home. That is the challenge for the incoming health minister for sure, um, because uh, because we're not going to be able to have all roads lead to the hospital and the healthcare system any longer. That is uh, profoundly important advice for both us and for the next minister of health. So, uh, Dr. Danielle Martin, we're really grateful you could share some of your election night with us. Enjoy the evening, if that's possible, and talk to you down the road sometime, I'm sure. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.